a month. That's how long it had been since she had been in the mood to study with me. Actually, for the last three months, especially the last month. She just hasn't been herself. We just had a fight last night. I'm tired of her behavior lately. She always had a temper and could hold a grudge for days. After all, she was a full-fledged Irish woman. Her maiden name was Catherine O'Brien. But now, she was Catherine McCarthy, not Kate or Katie. Just Catherine. Early on in our relationship, I made the mistake of trying to call her Cat, and oh, how I heard it. My name is Kurt McCarthy. I'm her husband. Yeah, I'm Irish too. We've been together since high school. We started dating when we were 16 years old. I learned early on to get out of the way when she started her tirades. It's been that way for the last 26 years, 22 of which we've been husband and wife. Even though she had a temper, I still loved her. Red hair, green eyes, fair skin with freckles. I loved it all. We were each other's first boyfriend and girlfriend. What's more, we had our first kiss when we started dating. We talked about what we were comfortable doing. She said, I'm going to be a virgin on my wedding day. I respected that. Today, like so many times before. She said, I like the way you do it. As we were doing it this time, however, it was different. I got up and said, I'm going to take a shower. I knew that if I didn't do it first, it would be an hour before I could get to the bathroom. As I let the water stream down my body, I kept thinking about what she had said. She had said those words hundreds of times. So why did they bother me now? I'm sure part of it was because the past few months our relationship had been strained. I didn't even know why. I just knew how to stay away from her when she was in that mood. Usually they didn't last more than a week. Ten days tops. Something like this. Lasting a whole month was unprecedented. I like the way you do it, she said. Why did that bother me so much? I finished my shower and wrapped a towel around me and walked into the bedroom. Hey, sleepyhead, it's your turn. She groaned, but got up and headed for the bathroom. For the first year of our marriage, we couldn't tear ourselves away from each other before work, after work, and sometimes at lunch if we could get away. This was when I worked as a mechanic and she worked at Target. Those were the days when we were poor, but completely in love with each other. I continued working as a mechanic until about age eight. That's when the owner of a local Napa franchise suggested I move to his place of employment. He appealed to my desire to do something different with my life. I was making about $40,000 a year turning wrenches. We talked many times when I went to pick up parts or when he delivered to our store. He had two stores at the time, was about to open a third, and needed a manager. He decided I was a good fit. Obviously, I knew about cars and parts. I was a certified, and he liked the way I interacted with customers. One night after work, he took me out to dinner to discuss opportunities. I thought he just wanted a manager. What he really wanted to talk about was a business opportunity that could provide a living for Catherine and me. He asked me if I'd ever thought about owning my own business. Well, of course I had. I think most people have done it at some point in their lives. I won't bore you with the details, but the gist of it was this. I would work for him, making the same $40,000 a year for 10 years. And at the end of that time, he would sell the business to me. During that time, he would put $20,000 a year into my account for me to use as a down payment. When I bought the franchise. In addition, during this time, he would prepare me to take over the business. I have always been a trusting person, and a handshake sealed our deal. I gave him two weeks' notice and started working for him. At the time, I liked it because my 12-year-old son and 10-year-old daughter were active in sports. This would give me a flexible schedule to attend most of their games. However, it meant I would be working nights and weekends. The night I talked to Catherine about accepting the new job, she was furious that I hadn't talked to her first. I hadn't even had a chance to talk to her about future franchise opportunities. I knew she would be furious that I hadn't gotten anything in writing. I told her that I missed my children's childhood, and that this job would give me a chance to be a bigger part of their lives. I then told her that it would be good for all of us in the long run. She didn't want to hear anything, and I sat on her crap list for over a week. I really hoped that nothing would work out with my plan. I didn't want to experience the wrath of Catherine. I had experienced it many times before on camping trips, at birthday parties, 
and during vacations. Now, eight years later, I was looking forward to surprising her after only two years. Of course, the lack of pay raises over the past eight years led to heated discussions between us. I simply told her to trust me, which unfortunately was not easy for her. My schedule changed from 7.35 o'clock, five days a week as a mechanic, to any time between 9 o'clock and 7 o'clock during the week, and possibly some weekends. However, I had a flexible schedule that allowed me to see my kids play baseball, softball, and soccer. About two years ago, I began to notice a change in Catherine. Her usual short temper became even shorter. In addition, she began to belittle me on occasion. This can certainly hurt a man's ego and caused resentment for the past three months. The situation has gotten worse and worse. I tried to talk to her about it. At first, it had an effect. She apologized, and things got better for about a week. Then it would start up again. Lately, however, whenever I mentioned anything to her, she would throw an annoyed look at me, and her attitude would get even worse. Obviously, this affected our home life. I got to the point where I'd rather be at work growing the business than at home with her. On the other hand, the business has grown. We now have four locations, and our commercial business has grown steadily. My wife has always worked. She certainly took some time off when the kids were born, but soon returned to work. It didn't take her long to find a job with a group of insurance agencies. They have four offices around town, and she is now the office manager for one of them. As far as I can tell, she is doing an excellent job. I know from experience that managing people can sometimes be stressful, so I have to assume that part of my wife's attitude is due to that stress. I've asked her what has changed in the last two years, but she has no answer and gets angry when I'm too intrusive. As I get dressed to do some housework, my thoughts return to the gorgeous morning. I smile, remembering it, but something still bothers me in the back of my mind. I like the way you do it the rest of the weekend and all of next week. Things go back to normal, or rather back to the new normal. All week, Catherine has been irritable. Friday night she came home a little late again, and it was the same as the previous Friday. In fact, she was even more demanding that I show my skills in the bedroom. I've already mentioned that she's Irish, but so am I. And although I don't have that hot temper, I still have it. Her attitude and demands infuriated me when she said, I need you to cater to me. I replied to her, I don't jump on your command. You can service yourself. I wasn't going to be her lapdog. That night, I slept in my son Kevin's room. He had gotten his own apartment about six months ago, so his room was vacant. When I went into our bedroom to get some clothes, Catherine was in the shower. I heard her phone to alert her that she had a text message. I don't know what to call it. Karma. Fate. God's hand. Chance or Irish luck. But when Verizon upgraded a couple years ago, it changed the texting function on our phones. No longer do you have to unlock your phone to read text messages. New messages pop up, and you just have to tap on the message icon to read it. That day, this update changed my life forever. I picked up the phone and saw a message from CB that read, So did he do it? Who is CB? What did he mean in that message? Was I really the one who was supposed to do something? Thought I. It had to be. She didn't do anything last night after the fight. Moreover, I don't think she received any calls. What was I supposed to do? And then it hit me. I like the way you do it. She said it in a different way than she had the last few times. She said it in a way that emphasized the word you as if she was comparing me to someone else. The problem is, she has no one to compare me to. Just thinking about it made my stomach cramp up. I ran to the bathroom, opened the toilet seat, and threw up my insides. Catherine asked, Are you okay, honey? I turned and looked at her. I had to look away as I choked in the toilet bowl again. I must be nauseous. I told her I needed time to think things through. I didn't want to accuse her and suffer anger if I turned out to be wrong. Do you think you ate something? She asked. She asked? Probably, said I, feeling bad again. I just don't know what or when. I stood up and she went to touch my head, but I backed away, saying, You better not come near me. I don't want you to catch anything. I turned and walked back to the bedroom, saying, I'm going to the store to get something for my stomach. I left before she could even get dressed. I drove and thought about the last few months and even the last two years. She must have had an affair. 
For how long, I thought. My high school sweetheart, my wife, my love, was no longer exclusively mine. Or maybe not mine at all. I had to know for sure. I had to have proof. I didn't have her phone password. And I didn't have her computer password either. We had always trusted each other and our privacy. How could I get proof? Somehow, I had to find out. I drove around the neighborhood, but I couldn't stay out too long, or she would start to worry. I had to come home with Pepto-Bismol, Dayquil, and Nyquil in hand. I stopped at the grocery store, and then headed home. I would pretend to be sick and spend the day in Kevin's room. When I got home, I went straight to the bathroom, took a swig of Pepto and a small dose of Nyquil, and then went straight to my son's room. Catherine came in a minute later and asked, Are you feeling better? I didn't feel like talking to her, so I mumbled something unintelligible, undressed, and climbed back into bed. I flinched when she touched my forehead and said, You're not hot. Oh, I was hot. How could she do this to us? I'll make you chicken noodle soup. She said, No, I'll just throw it back out. I told her I didn't want her to do anything for me. I didn't trust her. For all I knew, she could try to poison me. I'm just going to go to bed. I'm sure I'll feel better after a good night's sleep. I told her, okay, I'll check on you in a little while, she said as she left. Of course I wasn't going to sleep. Our whole life together was running through my mind, meeting, getting married, having kids, vacations, Kevin's graduation, and soon Caitlin's. I couldn't find anything in all those memories that could explain what I suspected. Sure, the past two years had been stressful, but I didn't know why. What had changed? I had to find out. Lying on the floor, I began to formulate a plan. I needed proof. Once I had proof, I would realize our marriage was over again. I'm Irish. We have a temper and hold grudges. Forgiveness is not usually our style. Look at the Irish-English conflict. How long does it last? If, in fact, she cheated on me, I can never forget. And I will never forgive. Especially if what she was trying to get me to do was true. Such disrespect is trying to get my husband to clean up after his mistress is impossible to forgive. Somehow, I needed proof, and I needed to know when to get it. When you live with someone for as long as we have been together, you know them perhaps better than they know themselves. All of this vast knowledge would help me immensely in the days and weeks to come. But even with all that knowledge, it was Irish luck that gave me the information I needed. I needed to use the bathroom. So I got up and headed for the master bathroom. Catherine was in the kitchen, but her cell phone was on the nightstand. I picked it up and found another message from CB. It read, I made a reservation for Wednesday afternoon. What reservation? Thought I a hotel reservation immediately came to mind. As a general rule, a restaurant doesn't require reservations for the afternoon. A reservation might be necessary for dinner or even lunch, but not during the day. Where was the question? I guess it didn't matter. I could take Wednesday afternoon off and follow her again. Another benefit of being a manager and having a flexible schedule, avoiding too much time around Catherine for the next four days, turned out to be not as difficult as you might think. Thanks to pretending to be sick on Saturday and Sunday, and my schedule on Monday and Tuesday, I only had minimal exposure to her. True, I had to sleep in the same bed with her on Monday and Tuesday. I didn't want her to suspect anything. Of course, there was no contact. I could barely stand to get in the same bed with her, let alone touch her. It's amazing how you can love someone one day and be repulsed the next. So on Wednesday, I excused myself from work on my lunch hour and drove to her place of work. I stopped at Wendy's on the way and grabbed a bite to eat, but my stomach was in knots, so most of the food was left uneaten. I parked on the side street next to her building. The parking lot was visible, but I was far enough out of the way that she wouldn't notice me unless she was looking for me. After about an hour and a half, I began to doubt what I suspected. Was it just an innocent text message? Was it purely work-related? I had to know. The other messages I saw still made me believe I wasn't wrong. I decided I would sit there for the rest of the day if I had to. At about 2.30, I saw her boss walk out to her car and drive off alone. Now, I was really doubting myself. Was I really being a paranoid fool? I kept thinking about the messages and how she was acting, especially lately. Something had to be up. 
Fifteen minutes passed before I saw my wife leave the office. That was it. Whether her meeting with her boss would be innocent or not, I followed her as she drove away. She must not have noticed me following her from afar, because she drove right up to the motel and parked right next to her boss's car. It wasn't a hotel with conference rooms, but a motel with all the rooms facing the main parking lot. I parked on the street, mostly out of sight. She fiddled around in the car before getting out of it to go into the room. When she got out of the car, I noticed even from a distance that she didn't look the same as she always did. She walked determinedly towards one of the rooms, and as she approached the door, it swung open. Carl stood there and greeted her. I took a picture on my phone before he closed the door. What I suspected was true. She would pay for this. Like I said, when you live with someone for as many years as we've been together, you know them. Maybe even better than they know themselves. I knew what I had to do to make the most of it. I'm Irish as I said, so I have a temper, and I'll use it to get revenge. I will get revenge on both of them. I left furious. I drove straight home. Caitlin was at softball practice, so I had time to do what I needed to do. We have a house on the outskirts of town. We bought it because it had enough room for me to build a two-car garage with a finished room upstairs. This was my man cave. I installed a hoist so I could work on our cars and make some money on other cars. This garage was my refuge from the stresses of the day, as well as the tantrums Catherine threw periodically. I even had a single bed upstairs for when I found myself in the doghouse. In fact, that's what I called my garage the doghouse. When I got home, I immediately went to our bedroom and shook all of my clothes out of my dresser and closet. She wouldn't notice they were gone because I'm sure she'd try to give me that crap again. Demanding that I come into the bedroom to service her, I knew she wanted to disrespect me by making me clean up her lover's leftovers. I took my clothes and toiletries to the man cave, and then returned to the house to wait for my loving wife to arrive. It was 5.30 when she walked through the door. I was watching TV, deliberately ignoring her when she asked, Is Caitlin home? No, I replied. She probably went out to eat with some friends from the team. Caitlin was a good kid. It was her senior year. We didn't worry when she didn't come home right after practice. She'd probably text one of us soon to let us know where she was and when she'd be home. Oh, she said, in that drawn out, I have an idea tone that women do when they want to get something from their husband. I didn't look at her. I knew what she was thinking, but I wanted her to work on it. So we have an open seat. What would you like to do? she asked insistently. We could grill a couple of steaks and a couple salads, said I, still pretending to be absorbed in the TV program. I can think of more delicious meals, she said. Really pouring it on. Well, if you want to order takeout, go ahead, let me know where and when it's ready, and I'll go get it. I said this in an indifferent voice. I'll tell you where and when, she replied, in our bedroom in about a minute. I looked up at her, feigning slight confusion. Let's go up to our bedroom and enjoy the... Hey, she said. I took the bait and ran after her up the stairs. When she came out of the bathroom, I saw her for what she had become a 42-year-old woman to keep from dying. I closed my eyes and thought of younger women. Her eyes were closed, waiting in anticipation. I got out of bed and opened the nightstand drawer. Hearing the sound of the drawer opening, she opened her eyes and looked at me. What are you doing? she asked. Aren't you going to use your knowledge and experience to take the edge off me? I said. I don't feel like it. What the heck? she asked. What are you doing? Putting on protection, said I calmly. What? she said questioningly. Now came my revenge, I said. I don't know where you've been, so I'm protecting myself. I could see the blood rising in her face like mercury in a thermometer. She was ready to explode. What are you accusing me of? she screamed. You know perfectly well what you were doing. We both know I said this with a matter-of-fact facial expression. She exploded. You goddamn loser! How dare you stand here and accuse me of anything? Who the heck are you? A manager at an auto parts store. A wimp who's been in the same position for the last eight years, unwilling to even ask for a pay raise. Now she was working her butt off. That was the real reason for what she was doing. She had no respect for me. My love devotion, and sacrifice for her and our children was not enough. I put my clothes back on as she continued to scream and humiliate me. Then I walked out. 
I went to the doghouse and went up to the man cave and closed the door behind me. About two minutes later, she was downstairs in the garage, yelling for me to come down and face her like a real man. I knew my act would pee her off, so I called the police. I had never called the police on my wife before, so I decided to use this to my advantage. If I timed it right, I would be in the yard the moment the cops showed up and they would witness her rampage. She raged down the stairs to the garage, demanding that I come down. There was no regret or remorse in her words for what she had done. She was just angry that I had humiliated her by essentially calling her a cheating cheater. After a couple minutes, when I didn't come down, she came over, tried the doorknob, and started pounding on the door, shouting obscenities at me. After about five minutes of tirade, she backed away from the door, after which it got quiet. I figured she had gone into the house to get the spare key. I knew she would be back, so I pushed the bed in front of the door. Then I smelled something unusual. What was she doing? I pushed the bed away from the door, unlocked it, and looked down into the garage. I didn't see her. Instead, I saw my workshop on fire, an empty gas tank lying on the floor. The flames were spreading fast, and I screamed. What the heck are you doing? There was no response. She was already outside. I ran to the window in the upstairs room and saw her standing there with a smile on her face. I opened the window and climbed down to the small roof above the garage door. I stood there for a few seconds, looking at the ground fifteen feet below me. I could hear the garage fire burning. I jumped, hit the gravel, and fell to my hands and knees, twisting my ankle in the process. As I was crawling away from the burning building, she ran up to me and started shouting insults. I tried to get away from her as she swung at me, at which time police officers drove up and got out of their car. I heard one of them call for a fire truck, and another grabbed Catherine, subdued her, and handcuffed her. Despite the police restraining her, she was still screaming. Take it away, you jerks. Your precious doghouse is going to burn down. The cop put her in the back of his patrol car and approached me, trying to figure out what was going on. I told him the PPG version of the evening's events from when I got home to when they showed up. We were both taken to the police station, and I gave a statement. She was arrested for arson with possible attempted murder. I asked the police officer if I could get a restraining order against her, and he said, you should probably talk to a lawyer. I called my lawyer on my cell phone and explained the nature of the problem. He mostly dealt with business law, but referred me to a criminal defense attorney at his firm. The next day... I got a restraining order. She could not come within 500 feet of our home, the business where I work, or myself. She was still in jail and would be there until the arraignment hearing. It worked out even better than I had planned. Irish luck shone through, at least for me. That night, I had to tell Kevin and Caitlin what had happened. Caitlin wasn't surprised by her mom's actions. She had seen examples of Catherine's anger all her life. I apologized to her, and she hugged me. Kevin was furious. It would take him a while, but he would get over it. My children were everything to me. It only confirmed my decision to take a job that allowed me to spend more time in their lives. The next day, I went to another attorney at the firm and had him draw up a divorce petition. Upon returning home, I discovered a police car in my driveway. Catherine was allowed to take her clothes and other necessary items from the house under supervision. I read the ruling turned around and drove away. Apparently she had posted bail, probably for her lover. This weekend passed quietly as I dealt with the rubble that was my doghouse. I was able to salvage a lot of metal tools, but all of my diagnostic equipment was broken. I called my insurance agent, but he couldn't tell me if it would be covered or not, since my wife also owns the garage and its contents. That would be a fight for another day. I was reviewing our life together. She was my first and only love. I was her first, but obviously not her. Only. How was I supposed to go on with my life? I knew I couldn't go on living with her. Trust was a very important factor to me, and I couldn't forgive and forget. It's not in my character. As I said before, I hold a grudge. That would be the ultimate offense. However, I had to find out the reason it was essential to my sanity. Was Carl the first? What had led up to it? Had I done something or not done something? From the way she was yelling at me, she didn't respect me. Did their conversations lead to this? 
Was he also belittling me? Belittling me? Was he downplaying my role as manager of the Napa parts store? I needed to find out more about this Carl Benson. I turned to the internet to do as much research as I could. It's amazing what you can learn about a person. I found out that my wife's business owner hired him about two years ago as a general manager, overseeing the business in all four offices. This was so the owner could step back and try to enjoy his golden years. I guess it was no coincidence that my wife started acting differently around this time. It made me wonder how long it had been going on. Carl was single, divorced, and had three children between the ages of 15 and 20. They lived about an hour away. I would have to research the situation some more. In the meantime, I was going to contact the owner. We had met at many company events, and what's more, he had started servicing his cars at the shop where I worked. I was on good terms with him, and was sure I could get his phone number from my previous boss. I wanted to call him and let him know what was going on. It would be on my to-do list for Monday. Sunday night, Catherine finally called me. She was very apologetic. Oh, Kurt, I'm so sorry. I lost my temper and set your garage on fire. She said, so what? I said so I can go home. Then she asked, No, I have a restraining order against you. I told her yes. I was told that when I was out on bail. Who bailed you out? Mom and Dad. They're not thrilled about it. Well, neither am I. Can we sit down and talk about it? I'm sure we can work it out, she said. We can't work it out. There's nothing to solve. Kurt, you know I love you. It's just my temper, she said. No, I don't know that you love me. If you loved me, you wouldn't be sleeping with your boss. I replied, that's not true. What's not true? That I don't know if you love me or that you're sleeping with your boss. She was quiet for a few seconds and then replied, both. Catherine, I saw you with him at the motel. Don't try to deny it. She gasped. Why? I asked. I really wanted to know. It was a mistake. It was a one-time thing, she said. B.S. Catherine, I'm tired of listening to your lies. I hung up and turned the phone off. About half an hour later, there was a knock on my door. It was her father. He was like a second father to me. I had known him for over twenty-five years. When he walked in, I could see the confusion on his face. What did she tell you? I asked. That you had a fight and you kicked her out. He replied. So half-truths were the usual M.O. here. I shook my head. So how did she explain that she was in jail? I asked. You know her character? She told me that after you kicked her out, she went to your garage and started burning your car repair manuals, and it got out of hand. I shook my head again. I think you need to get the truth out of her. I told him so. You're going to tell me what is the truth? He asked. I don't think you want to hear it, Mr. O'Brien. I told him. Why the formality, son? You know I consider you my son, he said, because soon we won't have that relationship. You'll probably hate me. Reason? Why is it really that bad? He asked hesitantly. I nodded my head, and he understood. And for how long? I don't know. I know our relationship changed about two years ago. It got worse three months ago, and the last month has been almost unbearable. I could see the pain in his eyes. No father wants to even think about his daughter doing that, much less with someone other than her husband. He nodded at me, turned, and walked out the door. A few hours later, I got a text from him with only one thing in it. I'm sorry. So she had to come clean. He must have gone home and put her on the hot seat. I'm sure there were quite a few outraged voices in the house. I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't immediately take her to the confessional. Whether she told the priest all, some or none of it, I couldn't even guess. When I called the owner, he recognized my name immediately. Kurt, how are you doing? To what do I owe this call? I'm sorry, sir, but it's not going to be a very pleasant call. I said, oh, he said, and waited silently while I gathered my thoughts. How do I tell a man that the woman he knows as my wife is having an affair with his business manager? I thought you should know that my wife and I are getting a divorce. I said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. She's always been a great employee for me. So what does this have to do with me? I could hear the hesitation in his voice. He knew I wouldn't have called him if it didn't concern him in some way. The reason for the divorce is because she was having an affair with Carl Benson. I'm sorry, but I'm not going to be kind to him. And some of the consequences could affect your business. I told him. 
Oh, crap. He said I knew I should have trusted my instincts when I interviewed him. I asked him why he wanted to move away from his family. He was already divorced, but he has children. I'm sorry. I probably should have checked him out more thoroughly. It's not your fault. They're both adults. They knew what they were getting into. Kurt, can you give me until the end of the week? I can't change the past, but I can certainly change the future for both of them. Sir, if you fire Catherine, it will hurt me financially in the divorce. I would appreciate your help with that, if you don't mind. She has always done a tremendous job for me. So yes, I think it makes sense to keep her. I thanked him, and we ended the conversation. He had always been a guy I liked, and having him keep her would help me a lot. The divorce papers were served on her at work. I asked that it be done in a way that would cause her as little shame and pain as possible. I was familiar with many of her co-workers, and I could tell we were friendly. I wondered how they would look at me now. She immediately called me as soon as she received them. I listened for about two seconds when the first words you hear when you say hello, are you god darn jerk? You realize it's not worth continuing the conversation. So I hung up. Being a mechanic, you've learned quite a bit about what makes a car run or not run. I had never used my knowledge with malicious intent before. However, things were about to change. Carl Benson's Lexus was about to need a new engine, depending on what he decides to do. He could have another engine or transmission fail. They say knowledge is power. I have to agree with them. Friday was not a good Friday for Carl. He was late for work because he had to tow his car off the side of the road, halfway to work. When he got there, the owner was waiting for him. He was let go for behavior unbecoming a person in his position. Catherine called me, and I answered in a cheerful voice. Hi, Catherine. What did you do? Is what I heard. What are you talking about? I asked. You know exactly what I'm talking about, she snapped back. Catherine, I think it's time we talked through our lawyers. Please don't call me again. I hung up as she tried to say something to me. I knew it would make her angry. She tried to call back, but I sent the message to voicemail and then deleted it. My revenge on her lover wasn't over yet. I called his ex-wife and explained my situation. She was very happy to help me. Saturday night she came into town and I made reservations at our family's favorite restaurant. I asked Kevin and Caitlin to join me. I was hesitant to involve them, but I needed to be sure that Catherine, and by extension Carl, would find out about it. The three of us arrived ahead of Carl's ex. That was the plan. There were four serving tables at the table, so I'm sure my kids thought their mom would join us. When Molly, Carl's wife, approached the table, I stood up and pulled back a chair for her. My kids looked at me questioningly. Kevin, Caitlin, this is Molly Benson. She's agreed to join us for dinner tonight. They didn't understand. I continued. Molly is Carl Benson's ex-wife. She is the ex-wife of your mother's lover. I thought it would be good to hear her story. Throughout the dinner, she told us about what led to her divorce. She talked about how she forgave him for one infidelity. But when he did it again, she realized she couldn't trust him. Trust is necessary in any relationship, friendship, business, or marriage. If you don't have trust, you don't have what it takes to survive. Your father and I wanted to meet with you. To make you realize that he is not divorcing your mother because he doesn't love her. I'm sure he still loves her, even though he probably hates her now. The reason for the divorce is trust. If he can't trust her, he will always wonder when she comes home late or runs errands somewhere. That's no way to live. Believe me, I know. By the end of the meal, we were all talking as a family. They asked her questions, and she answered them truthfully. She asked them some very pointed questions, and I learned that a year ago, they were already thinking that maybe something was going on. I think the husband would be the last to know, or even suspect it. When we got up to leave, we all hugged, and when Caitlin asked if I was going straight home, I said, I'm going to ask Molly to the dance, if she's still able to do that. I looked at her, and she nodded her head. Caitlin looked at me, and I realized what she was thinking. We danced until 11 o'clock, and then I drove her to the hotel. She invited me to her room, but I declined. As much as I liked her, and as much as I wanted to avenge her, it didn't feel right. It was too recent to file for divorce. However, I told her I would pick her up for breakfast. Old habits are ineradicable. So Saturday morning found us at my favorite breakfast place. 
The waitress saw me and approached. The usual for you two. Looking up from her order pad, she saw that my wife was not with me. She looked at me, perplexed. Heather, let me introduce you to Molly. She and I have danced the night away, and now we want a hearty breakfast to fortify ourselves. She was quiet for a moment, and then asked, What can I get you? I ordered my usual dish, and Molly ordered Eggs Benedict. We sat and talked and laughed, knowing what Heather was thinking. And I knew that one way or another, my soon-to-be ex would find out. We went back to her hotel, and she checked out. We spent the day together, and I thought, how could someone cheat on such a nice, beautiful woman? She left early in the evening, only to return before it was too late. Before she left, she said, If you ever want to spend more time together, let me know. I might agree to it sooner than you think, if you're still available. Somehow I doubted she'd be available. She was a godsend, but unfortunately, I hadn't been fishing yet. As I expected, Catherine found out about both my dinner and breakfast with Molly. The following week, I got a call from Catherine. So you're already seeing other women? You know, we're still married. That hasn't stopped you, said I. And besides, I haven't had anything with her. Yeah, sure. Dinner at night and breakfast in the morning. Did you two just talk all night? What we did is none of your business. We're getting a divorce. Have you signed the papers yet? I asked. No, I don't want a divorce, she said. Well, what you want won't stop it from happening. It'll just take longer. It's your own fault. Just sign the papers, and we'll move on with our lives. I said, ask your father if he would take you back if he were in my shoes. There was silence on the other end. She knew her father. There was no way he would have agreed to this. A few days later, I got a message from my lawyer. Catherine had signed the papers. She must have talked to her father. Of course, as anyone who has been divorced knows, you have to communicate with your ex, especially if you have children. Caitlin's graduation was the first time I saw her, a week after the breakup. She was with her family. We weren't sitting next to each other, but I could see her looking at me as I'm sure she saw me looking at her. After the ceremony, I went downstairs to congratulate Caitlin. Catherine and her parents were with her. I shook her father's hand, and he pulled me to him for a hug. Her mother was more aloof. Apparently, the women were sticking together. I was glad her father understood what I was getting at. Catherine turned to me, and I was surprised. Now that I was closer to her, I could see how much older she looked. She had lost weight, and it suited her, but I could see from her face that the woman had a lot on her mind. I even felt sorry for her until she said so. Still seeing Carl's ex. She said it in a tone like she was implying that we were sleeping together. I didn't dissuade her by saying she's an amazing woman. We had a great time. Then I asked, where's Carl? I thought he would be here. Kurt, you know he was fired. You were the reason he was fired. Among other things, he had a hard time finding a job. My boss didn't give him a glowing recommendation. He had to move out of state to further dig into my memory. I asked, and he didn't take you on? She looked at me and replied, I never loved him, and you didn't love me enough. I said, and walked away. I heard her break down and her mother say, loser. I didn't realize this churched lady knew such a word. The open house was scheduled for the following Saturday. Catherine and I agreed to hold it at our house. Yes, it was still our house. The divorce wasn't final yet. I let her handle all the arrangements, which also meant lifting the restraining order and allowing her free access to the house. It was hard for me to see her in familiar surroundings, doing familiar things. Molly was right. I still loved her, even though I hated her. When we were cleaning up after Caitlin left with her friends, I was in the kitchen taking out the trash. Catherine came up to me and said, Thank you for having the open house here and letting me be here. You'll always be her mother. Said I as I continued to work with the trash. Kurt, can you look at me? I stopped what I was doing and looked up at her. I'm sorry for what I did to us, she said. It was the first time she had apologized for her affair. Why did you do that? I asked wanting to know the reason. She cried and ran out of the room. She still couldn't tell me. Months went by. Our divorce progressed. Irish luck showered me again late last year when Caitlin received a letter asking her to accept college. We took out a second mortgage on our house. We got $100,000.
we paid $50,000 for her tuition and gave Kevin $50,000 to start his own auto repair shop. He followed in his dad's footsteps, took classes at the high school tech center, took online business classes, and got his AC certification working at my old store. I was so proud of him and told him I'd be happy to help in any way I could. Fortunately, this meant that other than a few 401 KS and a small amount of savings, there was very little equity to partition. We sold the house and split about $15,000. There was no alimony, as we both earned about the same. Catherine pleaded guilty to arson and was sentenced to two years probation. She also had to take anger management classes. This seemed to help. She also started seeing a therapist regularly, and that seemed to help even more. When the final decision to divorce came, she called me and asked if we could sit down somewhere and talk. Sure, I said. How about our favorite restaurant? When I walked into the restaurant ten minutes before we were supposed to be there, I saw that she was already sitting there. You could tell she was nervous, but she looked better. We ordered our food and had a light conversation while we ate. Then, without taking her eyes off her plate, she said, How nice. I miss this. Me too, said I. She looked up at me. I'm sorry, she said. I asked again why she knew what I was asking. I was stupid. I saw him handsome, ambitious, worldly. And then I looked at you, still living in the same city, in a job that leads nowhere and with no ambition. I know you took this job to be a part of our children's lives, and they have thrived because of it. If you hadn't taken this job, you'd be working until six o'clock every day. And missing most of their games, you gave up your future for them. I lost my understanding of that and lost respect for you because of it. I'm sorry. I'm also sorry for the way I reacted. I'm sorry I burned down your garage. I've learned a lot from anger management classes and therapy. She apologized more times during that conversation than she had in the last ten years. Perhaps she had changed. Thank you, I said. I'm sorry I didn't live up to your expectations. We parted with a hug and she whispered to me, if you ever need an outlet to vent, let me know. You've always been the best. I blushed, but I doubted I'd take her up on her offer. Probably spoiled fruit. As I drove home, I called Molly. Are you still available, or has someone already caught you? I'm available. I was dating a guy, but he found a younger model he thought was to his liking. I'm sorry to hear that for you, but I'm glad to hear it from me. When can we meet? I asked. My place or yours? She said. Your place, if that's okay with you. Sure, she replied. I was glad she agreed. I wanted revenge for the entertainment at her house that her ex-husband was still paying for. We had a great dinner and then went back to her house. Her kids, who were still living at home, were away at their dad's for the week. I needed to be honest with her. So I said, Molly, I really like you. I don't know where this is going, but I want you to know that I'm doing this for two reasons. The first is that you're a hot woman, and don't let anyone make you think otherwise. The second reason is I want revenge. You'll be my first time since I found out my wife was with your husband. I hope you're not embarrassed. I respect you, and I don't want you to feel like I'm using you. Kurt. She said, ever since you contacted me and we've been communicating for the past few months, I've realized that I want you to. Part of me wants revenge, too. I know Carl and I weren't married when your wife cheated on him, but I never got my revenge on his other cheaters. I'd like to even the score a little bit with those words. We ran to the bedroom. An hour later, I lay there thinking about my ex. I thought about our relationship in the early days. I'd noticed Catherine's bad temper. It had gotten worse over the years. She'd get angry about something and lash out at me verbally and sometimes physically. Yes, I'm Irish and I too can have a temper, but I would never take it back to her physically. That's the way I was taught when she started to use force. I would just retreat to my doghouse. I guess that probably made her respect me even less in her eyes. I didn't want to stay and fight back. I guess to her, I was a weakling, when she started setting fire to my garage that I was in. I realized I couldn't go on like this. I couldn't trust her. If we had an argument one night, I might wake up in piercing pain and find a knife stuck in me. I couldn't take that risk that the disrespect and loss of trust caused by the betrayal had forced me to end my marriage once and for all. I was a free man now. 
Would I ever be able to fully trust a woman again? Would I ever be able to let her into my life? Molly, I knew, was just a chance to get revenge and get some of my pride back. She was a wonderful woman, but I knew it would never be a couple-type relationship. We could be friends with benefits, but that would be the end of it. We couldn't build a relationship on the animosity we felt toward our former spouses lying next to each other. We caressed each other, and I said, You're an amazing woman, Molly. You knew exactly what I needed. Me, she replied. You were the one who did all the work. You knew exactly what I needed. And when? You are an incredible and generous lover. I can't believe your ex would look for something else when she had someone like that waiting for her at home. What an idiot. I know for a fact she didn't get that from my ex. I was hoping we could continue our friends with benefits relationship. I really liked her and enjoyed the time we spent together. We would lay around and talk. I told her that she was only the second woman I had ever been with. Furthermore, she was only the second woman I'd even kissed. As I was leaving, she kissed me and said, I hope this continues. Me too. But I'm not ready for a serious relationship yet. Then I hesitantly said, I really enjoy spending time with you, but I want to ask you a favor. I'll reciprocate if that's what you want. What's that? she asked. If you don't mind, I'd like to somehow make sure your ex knows about what happened last night. I'll make sure mine finds out too, if you want. That sounds delightful, she said, smiling slyly. I'm sorry if I came across as vindictive, and I don't want you to think that's the only reason I did it. No problem. I was thinking the same thing. I'd like a little revenge when someone does bad things to me, she said getting in the car. I pulled out my phone and texted Catherine. Call me when you have time. Can be Monday. Nothing urgent. I never used all those abbreviations in my messages. I guess I'm old-fashioned. Not three minutes later, she called me. Hey, Kurt, are you taking me up on my offer? No. I'm exhausted. I don't need it yet. Molly is very energetic. There was silence on the other end of the wire. Then I heard her whisper to herself. Eight. Nine. Ten. Did you loser have to call to rub your trust in the red-headed Irish woman showed her temper again? This time, she at least counted to ten. Wait, I didn't call you. I texted you. I said it wasn't urgent. You could have called me on Monday, said I. I'm sorry, she said. Apparently, the anger management classes had only partially worked, but she apologized nonetheless. I wanted you to call me about your plans with Caitlin for the near future. Do you have any vacations planned that I should know about? I needed to find some excuse for her to call me so I could throw in a little barb about Molly. Oh, I'll have to call back. I'll talk to her and see what she'd like to do. Okay, any time. Just let me know. I hope that my casual attitude about the fact that we were divorced would hit a nerve with her. I wanted her to feel that it meant nothing to me to be without her. I was actually hurting. I think guys have a harder time with divorce than women. I'm not sure if it's the Neanderthal feeling of losing your woman, or if it's guys' tendency to be competitive. We don't like to lose. I just knew it hurt, and I wasn't going to let myself suffer like that again. At least not for long. About a week later, something happened that I pretty much expected to happen. Carl knocked on my door. Or rather, he started knocking on my door. I called 911, and they answered. I told them my address, hung up, and opened the door. He burst inside. I yelled, Carl Benson, get out of my apartment. You have no right to be here. I don't care. I'm going to punch you in the face. He yelled, Get the heck out. I yelled back. You were a piece of crap when you entertained my wife, and you're still a piece of crap. What's your problem now? Stay away from my wife, he shouted. You mean your ex-wife? She kicked your butt out years ago for cheating on her. I guess you never learned your lesson, replied. I stay away from Molly, he muttered. Why should I stay away from her? She's a great piece of butt. Then he lost his temper. He lunged at me, swinging his arms. I deflected the first blow, but I let the second one land. I had to show him the damage. A guy who works on cars, even part-time, is usually in better shape than someone who sits in an office behind a desk. By the time the cops arrived, I was in bad shape. But he looked even worse. They separated us, figured out I was the one who made the call, and put him in the patrol car, sending him to the station. I cleaned myself up a bit, then called Molly to let her know her ex-husband was in jail. I know, she said. 
Can you believe he had the nerve to call me to bail him out? She paused, then asked, Are you all right? A little worse, but he got the worst of it. I'll be right over. Play nurse, she said, and hung up. About an hour later, she was nursing me back to health. I was glad I was working the late shift the next day. I didn't have to get up until 11 o'clock, and even then, I only got about four hours of sleep. As she was leaving, she said to me again, I love the way you do it. Your tongue and fingers are just magical. I wondered if I should back off. I didn't want to get too involved. I was soon to have a serious conversation with her. After lunch while I was at work, I got a call from Catherine. I had no clients at the time, so I answered the phone. What did you do? She asked. Well, hi to you too, said I. Yeah, hi. What did you do? What are you talking about? Said I, playing dumb. You arrested Carl? No, he arrested himself, said I. That's not what he said, she replied. So there you go. You're taking the word of your lover over your ex-husband. That sounds about right. He's not my lover. That was over a month ago, she said. You're the one who said that. Teased I, she said. Why do you have to be such an butt? I must have had a good teacher, replied. I... So, are you going to drop the charges? She asked. Why would I? He breaks into my apartment uninvited and starts hitting me. Why should I drop the charges? Because he's going to lose his job and because I asked you to. She said, You're not my wife anymore. I don't have to do anything you say. You no longer have the right to ask me for anything. After that, I hung up the phone. Several months after, she allegedly stopped having fun with him. She was still trying to help him. He was charged with assault and battery and will likely spend at least 90 days in jail. He's definitely going to lose his job over this. I just smiled when I heard that that Thursday, I found myself at a bar that used to be our bar, Smitty's. I know I should have thought better of it, but when things are going downhill in your life, a familiar place helps you come to your senses. I was sitting at a small pub table sipping a beer when I heard a familiar laugh. Of course it was my ex, looking in the direction of the laughter. I saw that she was with all the girls from her office. There were half a dozen of them, and they were heading this way. Catherine saw me, and almost stopped on the spot. She turned to her friends and said something I couldn't hear. They turned and found a table as far away from me as possible. But the problem for them was that they would have to walk past my table, or around the perimeter of the room to go to the bathroom. After about ten minutes, two women headed for the restroom. I thought, what is it with women? Why can't they go to the restroom alone? Do they always have to have at least one woman with them? Anyway, one of the women stopped at my table and asked, You're Catherine's ex, aren't you? I nodded my head. I've heard a lot about you. She said this with a twinkle in her eye. I wasn't sure what that look was, or what she might have heard. I figured it was no good if it was coming from my ex as she was coming back from the restroom. Both women stopped and started talking to me, actually flirting with me. One of them was probably about ten years younger than me, the other about fifteen years younger. I guess women don't have the same code as guys. Guys don't hit on or date their friends' exes. That didn't seem to be a problem. Of course I flirted back. If I managed to sleep even for one night with one of these women, it would be one more thing to annoy my ex-wife. Yes, I was vindictive. I wondered how long it would be before the need for revenge disappeared. As the two women began to leave my table, one of them extended her hand to shake mine and said it was nice to meet you. Maybe we'll meet again. In her hand as she shook mine was a piece of paper. I discreetly took it and waited until they were back at their table before looking at it. It was her business card, and on the back was her cell phone number. Shannon Lozano would be sure to call me. I looked over to their table and saw Catherine looking at me. There was sadness in her eyes, but then it was replaced by the fury I had seen in her eyes so often before. I reflected on our relationship. I loved her, still do now, but she was always like an active volcano, ready to explode at any moment. The fact that I had lived with it for so long was a testament to the fact that love can make you blind and willing to put up with almost anything. I would still be there if she hadn't cheated on me. Was I better off now? I didn't know. Ignorance is bliss. So I guess I was in my own bliss. I looked at my beer. It was almost empty. 
I finished it, threw a ten on the table, waved to the waitress, and walked out. I didn't look toward my ex's table. I didn't want her to see the tears that were starting to form in my eyes. Late Saturday morning, I pulled a business card out of my pocket and dialed the number. Shannon picked up on the third ring. Hello? She said uncertainly. Hi, Shannon. This is Kurt McCarthy. We met at the bar Thursday night. Yes, I remember you. You're the handsome man who was sitting alone drinking a beer. I blushed at the compliment but replied, Yeah, that was me. I just needed to relax and think. Would you like to talk to someone about those thoughts? Such directness shocked me somewhat. Yeah, I think I would like to. I heard my words before I even thought about it. How about tonight? She suggested this time it only took me a second to think about it, and I said, Sure. How about Smitty's at 7.30? I'll be there. She said when I hung up the phone, I was really nervous. What could a woman, perhaps ten years younger than me, see in me? Would I even know how to act? I hadn't been on a date in over twenty-five years. What did women want? What did they expect? There was only one way to find out, and tonight was going to be it. I dressed business casual, which was a little over the top for Smitty's on a Saturday night, but I wanted her to see that I had made an extra effort. We found common ground right from the start. She was nice to look at and nice to talk to. After I felt comfortable with her, I finally asked the question that had been bugging me since I met her. You work with my ex, so I'm sure you've heard the worst about me. Why would you, knowing that, want to date me? Well, before she started hanging out with Carl, about a year before you sent in your divorce papers, she said some things about you that intrigued and excited me. She had been having fun with Carl for a year, I asked, flabbergasted. No, they were just socializing, having lunch, and so on. You know, I think she probably started her affair about three months before you served her. That was consistent with what I knew about her changing attitude. I'm sure she felt guilty at first, but as things progressed, she probably thought I was clueless and lost all respect for me. Up until this year, when we had bachelorette parties, she let me know several times that she was pleased with your performance, if you know what I mean. She looked at me with those eyes that only women seem to possess, and licked her lips. I blushed. I know some women say things like that, but I never thought Catherine was one of them. Don't be embarrassed if you're half as good as she led us to believe. You'll be a pleasant adventure. She looked at me like a lioness. Looks at a gazelle. What did I gotten myself into? As we were finishing our food and drinks, a waitress came to the table with our check. She smiled at me as I handed her fifty dollars and said, You better keep this check. You might win a prize. I looked at her with a puzzled expression on my face. She looked me straight in the eye and winked. I slipped the check into my pocket, and as we walked out, Shannon took my hand and said in a soft voice, Now for dessert. Once again, I was taken aback. It had been too long since I'd gone on a date. My place or yours? she asked. I'll let you decide. I wanted her to feel as comfortable as possible, so if she preferred the home turf, that's where we'd go. Let's go to your place. You can tell a lot about a person by seeing how they live. I'd like to know a little more about you, she said. So off we went to my place. She jumped in my truck, so at one point I had to bring her back to get her car. I asked her, Do you think your car won't get hurt here for the rest of the night? Yes. I knew I was being presumptuous, but she gave me no hint that it wouldn't be a night out. Oh, I took an Uber for just that reason. Wow. I felt out of touch with today's reality again when we walked through the door. We rushed into the bedroom. We got busy. When we finally fell asleep, we slept until 10 a.m. We had lunch at Chili's, and then I drove her to her house. She made me promise that I would call her for a repeat performance. I assured her I would call as Deep Throat is addictive. On the way to the apartment. I stopped by the store, and when I went to pay for my groceries, I noticed a check from Smitty's in my wallet. I pulled it out and saw that the waitress had written her name and phone number on it. This new reality is going to take some getting used to. Monday after work, I went back to Smitty's and Helen. The waitress was there. She was closer to my age, and after we talked for a while, I asked her when we could go out since weekends were the main days for her job. We decided to go out on Wednesday. She had the day off. As I was walking to my truck, I got a phone call. Hello? 
I said, not recognizing the number. Hello? Kurt? said a female voice. Yes, I answered. My name is Bethany. I met you last Thursday night. Shannon and I stopped at your table at Smitty's. Oh yes, I remember you, I said. I was talking to Shannon today. She said she had a great time with you Saturday night, and I was wondering if we could go out sometime. Aren't I a little old for you? I asked. Not at all. I've always dated older guys. They're much more mature and easier to get along with. Well, sure. How about this Saturday? Would that work? Said I. Sure. She said, Where would you like to go? Asked me. Anywhere. I'll let you decide. I'm flexible, she said. We set up a date for Saturday night and she proved to be flexible. Some of the positions we tried I never would have thought possible. My Wednesday date with Helen went great too. As with Shannon and Molly before her, I was told I like the way you do it. Both women on Sunday. Molly called and invited me to come over for dinner. A home-cooked meal sounded wonderful, so I said yes. After an amazing meal, we spent time working. I was beginning to really enjoy the single life. Monday night I got a call that I was honestly looking forward to. It was Catherine. What the heck do you think you're doing? She asked in a tone I'd heard many times before. Sitting here watching TV, I replied, playing dumb. No, I mean you, a 40-year-old man dating women 10 and 15 years younger than you. Don't you have any remorse? You must be talking about Shannon and Bethany, I stated peremptorily. Yes, of course, she said. They both asked me out, and instead of spending time alone, I said yes. Dating has certainly changed. I liked not having to ask a woman out and face possible rejection. It's nice to be wanted and appreciated, I said. Well then stop dating the people I work with, she demanded. Why would I do that? I asked, because I said so. She replied, Well again, I don't have to do everything you tell me to do anymore. We're not married anymore. I'll date whomever I choose. You're only doing this to make my life harder, she said. No, I'm not making it harder. But if I am, it's an added bonus. How does my dating any of them affect you? They whisper behind my back and then openly say, I can't believe she let him leave. They're basically calling me an idiot. I thought if the shoe fits, but instead said, I'll ask them to keep our extracurricular activities to themselves. Will that help? No. Just stop seeing them, she demanded again. That I won't do unless they stop on their own. I enjoy spending time with each of them. They make me feel young and do wonders for my ego. You're a loser, she said, hanging up. I smiled and sat back, remembering the time I spent with each of them. They did contribute to my ego. Wednesday, I spent another pleasant evening with Helen. My life was one pleasant time after another. Thursday night, I received another phone call from Catherine. Now what? I thought to myself. I haven't met Shannon or Bethany yet, so I haven't had a chance to talk to them. Yes. How can I help you, Catherine? I said, connecting with the call. Really? And the waitress at Smitty's, too? Well, she's more age-appropriate. I thought you didn't want me dating younger women. I don't want you dating at all. I constantly have to answer their questions about what could be wrong with me letting you go, she said with annoyance. Well, just tell them that someone else was more your style, more in line with your life aspirations. She was quiet for a moment, then said in a low voice, I'll just tell them I was stupid. Then she hung up. I sat back and reflected on my life. Catherine and I had some good times, but then she started to drift apart. This was around the same time Carl was hired, so maybe something was going on even then. Now at least she was saying she was remorseful. I had mixed feelings about that. Sure. Part of me was glad that she felt stupid for giving up everything we had. Another part of me just wanted things to go back to the way they were but I knew that was never going to happen. You can't change the past, and this part of the past I would never forget, and I couldn't live with it. Sitting there, I started to feel sorry for myself. I was out of beer, so I decided to go to the store. As I was leaving the store with a case of Shinerbach, I got a call. It was Shannon. What's up? She said when I picked up the phone. I just bought a case of beer and was on my way home to drown my sorrows. Can I help you with that? I can try to cheer you up. Sure, you might be just what the doctor ordered. We drank a little. 
She expressed her pleasure many times. Around two o'clock in the morning, she said. I have to work tomorrow, so I'd better get going. Oh, I said. By the way, I appreciate you and Bethany mentioning something to Catherine, but if you could keep tonight to yourself, I'd appreciate it. She was a little depressed when I spoke to her earlier, of course, but still, it's hard to believe she let you go, she said. Thank you. You've successfully relieved me of my sadness any time, she replied, and I mean any time. Over the next year, the number of my friends with benefits grew. Friends Shannon, Bethany, Molly, and Helen learned of my abilities and asked to sample the goods. I didn't turn any of them down. Each woman, no matter her shape, size, or skin color, was a pleasurable adventure for me. I learned to please them all. Each of them had their own characteristics that they liked and that pushed them over the edge. Catherine started calling me a fool. At first, I didn't mind that I liked women, and I liked to give them pleasure. Each of them, at one time or another, uttered the phrase that started it all. I like the way you do it. When Catherine got used to seeing me or hearing about me with one woman or the other, she saw me at Smitty's and actually asked me out. You know, we were good together. Why not? For old time's sake? she asked. I couldn't go for it. I told her it wouldn't be the same when we were together. Everything I did for you and with you was done in love. Now we're just going to use each other, I understand. She said sorrowfully and went back to her table. Finally, the day came when I was awarded the Napa franchise. The owner was true to his word. He thanked me for my years of service and bargained a more than generous buyout for me. I had to take out a loan, but business was good and growing, so I wasn't worried about paying a large sum. I had originally agreed to the deal for the sake of financial stability and security, in old age, for Catherine and me. Now, it would just be my old age. That evening, I called Catherine and invited her to dinner. She agreed, and I made reservations at the best restaurant in town. I called and told her that a car would pick her up and that she should dress appropriately when she entered the restaurant. She looked radiant. She had done her best. She was wearing a long black dress that emphasized her features just right. The black color really accentuated her red hair and green eyes. I had no doubts why I had married her so many years ago. I just wanted to be enough for her. When she came to the table, I stood up. You look amazing, Catherine, I said. Thank you. You look very handsome in that tuxedo, too. What's the occasion? she asked. I'm having a celebration, and I wanted you to be the first person I told about it. Now I'm curious, she said. Let's sit down and eat. We can discuss it while enjoying the food and the atmosphere, said I, not giving her a second thought. We made small talk after we ordered, and as the meal began, as we got down to the main course, our conversation also became more substantive. Finally, she said, That's it. I can't take it anymore. What is it that you're celebrating? I smiled. I wondered when she would crack Catherine. After we were married, I worked as a mechanic, turning wrenches, as we call it. You seemed content, even happy about it. I, on the other hand, felt a little stuck in my job. Also, as you know, Kevin and Caitlin had started to get active in sports. My job didn't allow me to take time off to participate in that. Yes, I know we discussed it, she said. Yes, we discussed it. And I thought that when I told you about working at Napa and its flexible schedule, you'd be excited about the change. And I blew up, she said. I also told you that it would be good for us in the long run. Yes, I remember. She remembered. She lowered her gaze to her hands and fell silent. Well, I was working for my family, our kids, their activities, and you. It was all to make our lives better. She looked up at me, and sadness flashed across her face. And I ruined it all, she said. I didn't invite you here to bring up bad memories. Like I said, I brought you here to celebrate. She looked at me, hopefully. I wasn't sure what was on her mind. I just signed the paperwork today to buy a Napa franchise with four existing stores. I glowered. She looked at me with a stunned and confused expression on her face. She couldn't believe what I said and didn't understand what it meant. I looked at her and said, I know it will be harder work, but now I have a legacy, something that will financially support me for the rest of my life. I smiled again. 
The reason I wanted to tell you about this first is because it will guarantee that our children will have a large inheritance when I die. They will be able to either continue the franchise or sell it and get the money. Our grandchildren, when they come along, will benefit from the business. I can't tell you in words how happy that makes me. I looked at her again. She was melancholy. I asked, what's wrong? She began to cry. I listened to Carl when he told me you were a failure. No ambition, no drive, no goals. He said you would die without ever accomplishing anything in life. Now, she was really sobbing. I ruined everything because I lost faith in my husband. I took his word for it and lost all respect for you. Back then, it was easy for me to say yes to him when he wanted to show me how much better he was than you. Oh, Kurt, I'm sorry for what I thought of you and how I treated you. You were a great husband until I ruined him. You were a great father. Thankfully, I didn't ruin that. And finally, you were the best lover. I was told that over and over again, and I threw it all away. I'm sorry, Kurt. I hope you believe me. I'm sorry for everything I did to you that got us where we are now. She got up from her chair and headed for the bathroom, crying. One of the servers noticed this and followed her into the bathroom. Women just can't go to the bathroom alone. I wanted tonight to be a celebration so that our children and grandchildren would have access to wealth. I guess I didn't take into account that the news would have such an effect on her. I sympathized with her. She was in a lot of pain, but I couldn't comfort her. I couldn't open that door. It would cause too much pain if I did. Life makes us realize the consequences of our actions. Sometimes that realization causes us great pain. I got our serving girl's attention and asked her to bring the check. I knew Catherine would not be in the mood to continue our evening together. When she returned, she came to the table, and before she could say anything, I stood up and said, I've already paid the bill. I can take you home. Thank you. I'm sorry I ruined your holiday, as well as us all the way home. She cried quietly. I wanted so badly to hug her, but that might send the wrong signal, and I couldn't risk it. When I walked her to the door of her apartment, she opened it and looked at me with a look that said, Do you want to come in? I replied, I'm sorry, Catherine, but we can't go back there. She nodded, turned, and closed the door behind her. The next couple of years were busy with business, life, and lots of women. They say word of mouth is the best advertising, and the women really knew how to use their mouths both in and out of the bedroom. Not a week went by that I didn't have at least two different women to have adventures with. Of course, I always practiced safety. I didn't want to get infected or pass something on to any of the women. Catherine and I talked occasionally. Lately, we had been discussing Kevin's engagement. He had only been dating her for eight months, but he already knew she was the one. She came to his store to get her car repaired, and he was blown away. Her name was Amber Williams. They were going to have an engagement party to introduce everyone they knew. Kevin was hesitant to start a relationship with anyone until his business was successful, although his business wasn't going as far as he would have liked. He knew she was the one on the day of the engagement. I arrived early to help Kevin get everything ready. I rented a conference room at a local Sheraton hotel, and we bought some six-foot subs at Subway with all the supplies, as we were just about to finish cooking. Catherine walked in. She still looked good to me, as we had been together for over 25 years. She walked over to where I was standing by the punch glass. We never had an engagement. Kurt. No, but everyone we knew knew us both. Do you remember when you asked me to marry you? She asked. Sure. I may be getting old, but I can't forget my wedding or my vows. I said sometimes I wanted to hurt her. She hurt me so much. She looked at me and defiantly said, I said I was sorry. Can't we forget about it? It's been three years. Yes, I'm sorry, but this is Kevin and Amber's day. I'm sure we can be cordial throughout this day, said I. That would be great. Maybe we could be cordial from now on. She said it in the tone of condescending demand that she used so often when we were married. She confused me so much. Sometimes she acted like she was truly remorseful for what she had done, and sometimes her old temper and cruelty came out. Kevin and Amber's family and friends showed up at the house, so we had to be cordial. Kevin and Amber greeted everyone who came by, introduced everyone who came by, and introduced them to the other partygoers. 
About 45 minutes after the party started, I was talking to Kevin and Caitlin when I heard Amber's voice, Mom. I turned to look and saw the most beautiful woman I had ever seen, dressed in a beautiful floral sundress. She was about five foot eight inches tall, with a good figure, yellow blonde hair like her daughter's deep blue eyes that I could see from across the room, and a smile that made my heart skip a beat. Daddy, 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 said Kevin. That's Amber's mother. But even though she's divorced, she's not for you. I looked at him perplexed. Dad, she's very religious. That's why she made Amber go to a Christian college here in town. It was her alma mater, Dad. Amber's father cheated on her. And she's not accepting of men with your lifestyle. Kevin, I said before your mother left me, I was a one-woman man. I wish I had a single woman I could trust and give my heart to. Well, I don't know if she's the one. I don't think she'd even give you a chance. But I'll introduce you that would be great, son, I said. And he led me over to where Amber and her mother were standing. Mrs. Williams, I'd like to introduce you to my father, Kurt. Kevin, you're engaged. Can't you call me mom? At this point, Catherine walked up. You can, as long as he doesn't forget who is real. Mother is. Kevin turned and said, Mom, this is Amber. Mom, Alyssa. They hugged and started talking as I walked away. Catherine cut in just as I was about to start a conversation with a beautiful woman. I figured I shouldn't linger because I might say something to Catherine that would give Alyssa bad impression of me. I wanted our first conversation to be positive. I mingled with other friends and family members. Many of the men bantered with me about all the women I knew. Some women seemed a little aloof, but others were quite friendly. When I was talking to one of the divorced women, Catherine came over and told her, You better be careful with him. You never know what you might pick up. I got angry, so I looked at the woman Charisse and said, Don't mind her. She's just pissed that I'm not giving her any mercy. Kurt, you're in butt, said Catherine. You're the one who keeps interfering in my conversations. Why don't we just be polite and keep our distance, said I. Then I turned to Charisse and said, Why don't we take a little walk and talk privately? I didn't feel like accomplishing anything with Charisse today, but I wanted to get away from Catherine and pee her off at the same time. I still wanted to talk to Ellis, but I wanted to do it when Catherine couldn't interrupt. Teresa and I talked for a while and parted ways, promising to talk again. About two hours after the party started, I got a chance to introduce myself to Elise. So you're the infamous Kurt? She said with slight disdain in her voice. I don't know what you've heard, but yes, I am Kevin's father. Kurt. Kevin seems like a fine young man. I hope he doesn't offend my Amber. I assure you, he is a fine young man. He knows what he wants and works hard for it, I said proudly. He will continue to build his business to become successful and will care and love Amber just as much. Well, I hope he stays faithful, she said, not afraid to say what she was thinking or who she might offend. I assure you he is faithful. You have nothing to worry about, pronounced I. I hope so, for Amber's sake. She then said, I hope you know it's going to be a church wedding. Yeah, that'll be great. Promises made before God and all their family and friends. I said, look, I think we need to clear the air. Obviously, you've been told things about me that may or may not be true. I would like to give you the opportunity to ask any questions you may have. I promise that you will find out the truth. I hope you will allow me to defend myself and maybe ask some questions of you. I don't know. I've heard so many things, she said. Look, we're going to be related. We should be able to at least talk to each other, I pleaded. I think so, she said meekly. I think it's going to take a little while, and this probably isn't the right place for it. We can sit around after the party, maybe have dinner. There he is, a smooth operator trying to use your charms to put my guard down, to leave me alone, she accused. Fine. You pick the time and place, and I'll work my schedule however you want, I said. Well, I live about an hour away, so if you're really interested in clearing that up, you can make the effort. Tomorrow is Sunday, and I'm going to church in the morning. Why don't you pick me up after church, and we'll go to Cracker Barrel? She gave me the name and address of her church and the end time of the service. I told her I would meet her there for the rest of the party. We subtly glanced at each other. I guess I was a mystery to her. In her eyes, I was a person to avoid, but I presented myself as an open book. Later, as the party was winding down, 
Catherine came up to me and said, Amber is cute, but I'm concerned about how fast they're moving. Did you know they plan to get married within the year? They will meet and get married within 18 months. How well can they get to know each other in that time? Catherine Kevin is a smart guy. He knows what he wants, and he's getting it. Meeting and getting married so soon can create some problems. But look at us. We knew each other for several years before we got married and still ended up divorced. The thing that determines whether they stay together is commitment. I think they're both very committed to each other. She looked at me with a look of regret on her face. She knew she had abandoned her commitment to our marriage. I felt good about leaving. Yes, even years later, it still hurt. And I needed her to remember that. Sunday morning I woke up early, shaved, showered, dressed in a nice suit, and made the hour-long drive to Alice's church. I arrived about a half hour before the service started and found a pew about a third of the way to the back of the church. I sat and looked around. The sanctuary looked very different than I was used to. I grew up in a Catholic church, and everything there was old-style stained-glass windows, altar candles, bells, communion table, crucifix, and chalice. Here I saw none of that. And what's more, there wasn't even a pulpit from which the priest could preach, just a raised platform at the front of the church, with a blank cross on the wall behind it. To say I felt a little out of place is an understatement. However, I was determined to see it through to the end. As people began to enter the sanctuary, they were talking to each other and having casual conversations. They were holding cups of coffee from Starbucks, or one of the other coffee shops in the area. They were also dressed in jeans and golf shirts or casual blouses. I felt a little too dressed up. Most people came up to me and greeted me. They didn't mind my costume and made me feel out of place. I kept looking around for Ellis, wondering if she had given me the wrong information. I couldn't believe it, or if she was sick and wouldn't come today. Then there was some activity up ahead, and the minister announced that the worship team was starting the service. That's when I saw her. She was singing with the praise band during the third song. She noticed me sitting there. I can't believe she hadn't noticed me earlier. I'm sure I stood out in my suit while everyone else was dressed in nice, casual clothes. She smiled at me as she sang. She had a beautiful voice. When she finished, she came over and sat next to me. I appreciated this, as I wasn't sure what I should do or when. I didn't expect you to come to the service, she said. I feel a little out of place. I guess I'm a little too dressed up for such an occasion. That's okay. But if you feel more comfortable, you can take off your costume. I followed her suggestion and laid it down next to me on the bench. Thank you for sitting next to me, I said. You're my guest. Of course I would have sat with you. Well, thanks anyway, said I. The service was quite different than I was used to, but it was pleasant, more relaxed. After the service, Ellis introduced me to the priest and many other people, saying this is Amber's future father-in-law. At Cracker Barrel, we started with some light conversation. Then, as we were finishing our meal, she started talking seriously. So, Kurt, I've been told you're a womanizer, and frankly, you sleep around a lot. What do you have to say for yourself? Well, first of all, what's your definition of a womanizer? I asked a guy who chases women around trying to get into their pants and once he gets what he wants, he dumps them, she explained. Well, if that's your definition, then I'd have to say I'm definitely not a womanizer. So what I've been told is a lie. She accused, let me tell you about myself and how I came to be who I am at this point in my life. Okay, spill it out. I'm listening, she said. I was married to Catherine. You met her yesterday. We were married for over 20 years and together for over 25 years. At some point in the last year of that marriage, she started cheating on me with her boss. When I found out about it, I followed her, and she went to a motel with him. She had treated me badly for several months prior to that. When I told her everything I knew, she freaked out and tried to kill me by setting my garage on fire while I was in it. I filed for divorce and got a restraining order. After the divorce, I started dating. This information may seem like too much for you, but I need to explain myself. Women talk, and I believe Catherine talked about my abilities in the bedroom. Some of these women wanted to find out if it was true. I didn't run after them. I just said yes when they approached me. These women told other women. And for the last two years or so, 
I never turned down any woman who asked me out. I enjoyed their company, and if I could give them any pleasure, I did. Please don't think badly of me. I just saw no reason to disappoint women, regardless of their size, shape, or skin color. Every woman is special in her own way, and I made them feel that way. If you think that's wrong, I'm sorry. She looked at me with a slight suspicion in her eyes, and then asked, So where do I fit in? Alyssa, you're a beautiful woman, you know that. From what I've been told, you've suffered just as much as I have. I chose companionship, and from what I've heard, you have closed yourself off from all men because of what your husband did. I would like to know if there is a woman among you who could get to know me better, and perhaps date me, whether you think about it or not. I'm a single man. I would like to find that one woman who would be the only woman I could share the rest of my life with exclusively. What about your ex-wife? Didn't she want to get back together with you? Forgive and forget. You know as well as I do that while it's possible to forgive, which frankly, I didn't. It's impossible to forget. You can't just forget what they did to you. You lose trust in them. You will always wonder where they are and who they are with. You can't build a relationship that way. No trust, no relationship. Pronounced. I, I understand, she said. My ex wanted me to just look past it and go on with my life, staying married like I used to. I couldn't do that. Not for him and not for me. My self-esteem took a huge hit. I wasn't going to let any man hurt me like that again. And I still don't. In that respect, we're very similar, I said. Except that while I continued to spend time with members of the opposite love, I never let them get close to me. Not in any real sense. Not where it mattered. She looked at me and nodded slightly. Then she said, repeating what she had said before. So where am I? Well, obviously we both have trust issues. I think I'd like to go out with you and get to know each other better. See if there's something there we could build a future on, said I. What about all the other women? She asked. If, after we've been walking around for a while, we both feel like it has potential, then I'd be happy to be exclusive to you. I said, let me be upfront and honest with you from the start, she said. I'm not doing this with anyone until I'm married. If we're going to date, you need to understand that. I grinned. Ellis. I dated Catherine in high school and after until we got married. We were both still virgins when we got married. Sure, we fooled around a lot after all. We were horny teenagers. But she stated to me at the very beginning of our relationship that she would be a virgin on our wedding night, and we stuck to that. So your statement doesn't bother or worry me. I'll be waiting for you. I think that reassured her because she said, Kurt, I appreciate your honesty. And to tell you the truth, I think I like you. Let's see where this goes. So four months went by during which we met at least twice a week. Sometimes she would come to my place by car, and the rest of the time, I would come to her place. During those four months, I still dated other women, but their attraction waned. Charisse, the woman from the engagement party after we went out a few times, really tried to work me up. She wanted more than I was willing to give. She, like everyone else, said, I like the way you do it. I could hear it in her voice. She was comparing me to others. It used to feed my ego, but now it was starting to bother me. When Alyssa told me over dinner at her house one night that she was ready to make a commitment to me, I glowed with happiness. That makes me the happiest man on earth, I said. From now on, I'm committing myself only to you. Honestly, the last four months have been meaningless when I wasn't with you. I know it might scare you, but I love you. Most people would probably chastise me for saying this so early in our relationship, but between dating, numerous long phone conversations, and my recent experiences with women, I've learned one thing women want to hear what you're thinking. She hesitated and said, I think I'm falling in love with you too. Please be patient with me. I was patient both emotionally and physically. One day when I was in an exceptionally good mood, I got a call from Catherine. Hi, Kurt, she said. Hi, Catherine. How are you today? And what can I do for you? Wow, you're in a good mood. Yes, of course I am. So what do you need? I said in a cheerful tone. Why don't we sit down for dinner sometime? I have something I'd like to discuss with you, she asked. Sure. How about tonight? That would be great. I can make your favorite dish, roast beef with vegetables. Can you come over around seven? 
Don't you want to go out to eat? I asked, not wanting her to spend so much time making dinner. No, I'd like to be alone, so I think that would be best, she said. I hesitated, then said, Okay, I'll see you then. Can I get you anything? Sure. Maybe some wine. Something to go with the roast beef. Okay. I'll pick up something. I'll see you tonight. I hung up, wondering what she wanted. We'd talked a few times before, but it was mostly just informational conversations. I was curious, but hesitant to find out what it was. In the interest of full disclosure, I called Melissa and told her. She replied, It must have something to do with the wedding. It is next month, after all. She must want something big since she's trying to soften me up with roast beef. I said, Call me tonight afterward and let me know what she wanted. She said, I will. At seven o'clock, I stood in front of Catherine's door. I had butterflies fluttering in my stomach. I was so afraid of what she wanted to talk to me about. She invited me in, and we chatted through most of dinner. Then she told me the real reason she invited me in. Kurt, Kevin's wedding got me thinking about what I asked about our wedding. About us, she said quietly. There is no us, Catherine said. I... She pretended like I didn't say that and said, Remember when we used to date? How we used to fool around? Yeah, I remember we were young, said I. We were good then, weren't we? Yes, we were, said I, honestly. What happened to us, Kurt? she asked. Life, I guess, I told her. I was talking about you with Shannon at work. Oh, said I. Yeah, I know she has a steady boyfriend now, but when she talks about you, she smiles and says you were exactly what she needed at that moment. Then I was talking to Bethany, and she said, you're no longer making the rounds, as she put it. I think maybe you're tired of playing around. Okay, said I, apparently neither. Kevin nor Amber had told Catherine that I was dating her mother. I smiled, thinking I appreciate their privacy. Catherine took that smile as an agreement with her. So maybe we should try again. You know, we were good together. She then said softly, Before I ruin it, Catherine, we were good together. The key word in that sentence was, I've realized over the past few months that I need to forgive you. When I said that, a huge smile appeared on her face. I continued, I forgive you, but I can never forget what you did. You need to move on with your life. She looked at me with tears in her eyes. Oh, Kurt, I'm so sorry for what I did to you, to us. I really am. I know we can get over it. Let's try again. She wasn't going to give up that easily. I almost hated to do it, but I had to let her know that it would never happen. I love someone else. Catherine, you said that Bethany told you that I wasn't making the rounds anymore. And that's true. You also said that you think I'm tired of playing around, and that's also true. But you both don't know why. Catherine, I'm in love with someone else. I'm no longer playing around because I'm committed to someone. I've become a one lover again. She just stared at me. I couldn't understand what she was thinking. Then she asked, Who is it? Alyssa Amber's mom. Her shoulders slumped. I think she realized that there was no way she was going to get me back. Even with all of our history, she knew that deep down, I was a one-woman man and that she was no longer that woman. We finished the rest of the meal in silence. When I finished, I said, Catherine, thank you for this dinner and for the memories. I know this night didn't turn out the way you wanted it to, but I know you will find someone when you do love him with all your heart and devote yourself only to him. I just couldn't stay mad at her anymore. I forgave her mostly because that's what Alyssa was getting me to do. She, in turn, forgave her ex. We came to the realization that we had to forgive them because their actions had ultimately brought us together. Pulling away from Catherine's apartment, I called Alyssa. So what was it? She asked. She wanted us to get back together. I thought maybe that was it. She knows what she lost. Yeah, and I know what I found and I'm better for it. Alyssa, I love you, and I'm a better person because of you, I stated. I love you too, Kurt McCarthy, she said. It was the first time she had ever said it out loud. I already knew she expresses her love in many different ways, but it was nice to finally hear it. Epilogue. Kevin and Amber got married, and Alyssa and I smiled, held hands, and danced the whole time.
A few people even jokingly said we looked like a wedding couple. Of course, Catherine was there, but she didn't stick around. I guess seeing us so in love was too much for her. Three months later, we became a wedding couple. A small private ceremony was held in our church. All of our friends and family were there except Catherine. She said her schedule didn't match. I think she just couldn't get over the idea that I had actually moved. It took her a few years, but she found someone too. I hope they last a long time. Oh, and one more thing. On our wedding night, Alyssa uttered that same magic phrase, I love the way you do it. The difference, however, was the emphasis on the word love.